Good afternoon, everyone. Today's topic, conflict management, powered by Cyber A for Teams, is one of the many assets security leaders must have to be proactive in their approach to addressing skill gaps, risks, and security today. Cyber A for Teams helps organizations build a cybersecurity-enabled workforce to tackle new challenges, handle security incidents, and prevent data breaches. If you'd like to learn more about Cyber A for Teams, you can schedule a free demo in the link we're going to be sharing out in the chat. For a limited time only, anyone who schedules a demo in June or July will be invited to join an AMA session with Ed right after the series. And without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Ed. Oh, well, thank you very much. That all sounds great. And I want to welcome everybody to our second session. Uh, if you missed first one, I'm pretty sure you can get the, re the replay. Um, and I wanted to give you a couple of things. We, we've written a series of case studies that kind of go with the six lectures, the six sessions. I didn't make a big fuss about it last week because you wouldn't have had a chance to read it. But what we'll do is in the chat, we'll make the uh, link available. You can download the, uh, the case studies. They match up with each of the sessions and, and you should read them. It's this fictional kind of scenario that, uh, that we invented. And it includes some discussion questions that you can take back with your own team and use during uh, you know, either town halls or team meetings. I, I always am looking for interesting things to do at team meetings. So this might be something that you can Use. So take a look. What, what I'd ask you to do is if you plan to come back for the next session, read the first two um, between now and um, the next time we get together. And, um, and we'll spend a few minutes discussing next week just um, any, any thoughts or comments or questions you might have about the case studies. Now, we're going to go about 40, 45 minutes or so. Then I have my good friend uh, Chris Kubeka from um, Hypersec is on. And we're going to uh, hear a little bit about her um, her journey to cybersecurity, and she's got, always has some good stories. So we'll ask her to share a little bit. I think you'll enjoy hearing from Chris. But in the meantime, the, the topic today is around conflict resolution. And for those of you who are new to the sessions, maybe didn't do our, uh, our course last year and, and didn't sit in for, the basic idea here is that my presumption is that those of you listening here would like to move into a position of management, govern, governance, leadership, and so on in uh, the area of enterprise security. So you may be an individual contributor now, you may be a manager now, um, or you may just be getting started. But in, in all of the cases I mentioned, I'm assuming that you'd like to develop some leadership skills. Um, if you are the world's greatest pen tester and you don't like dealing with human beings and you just want to pen test, this probably isn't the course for you because it's all really about interpersonal skills. And the reason I, I, I'm doing this is because there are a lot of courses on this, but none that I think talk to the specifics of what it is to do cybersecurity. We are an odd bunch and sometimes just speaking in a language that you understand and using examples that you understand will bring some of the leadership concepts to light. But if, you, if, you, you know, if you've taken leadership courses before, you'll see a lot of similarity in the, in the key messages here. And, and this week, we're going to focus on conflict resolution. And I've got some nice examples. And again, we'll, we'll draw our examples from enterprise security. But as we always do, I, I like to start with just a, a basic statement of belief here, and that's that you'd better figure out how to develop some conflict resolution skills if you want to manage in this area. Sadly, what we do is pretty well set up to create conflict. You know, the joke is that when you do cybersecurity in the Department of No, uh, you don't want to be that. But yeah, I mean, that's kind of the idea here that at times, it's your responsibility as the senior or one of the senior enterprise security leaders to make sure that if something's going left and it should be going right, that you speak up and that's going to create conflicts. You are going to have to develop some skills um, and hopefully our, our session today will give you some ideas. Well, the way you should listen to these is not to absorb everything and take notes and get every little idea but listen and be somewhat promiscuous around the things that sound like they match your situation. If, it, if every time we get together for an hour, you get one or two ideas, then that's so worth it. That, that's why I do webinars, you know, like when I'm at home and taking a break, you know, or somebody else might go out for a run. It's probably a pretty healthy thing to do. I, I tend to, uh, to listen to webinars and listen to podcasts. And I'm always looking for an idea 
a, a thought, something connects. Like great ideas are infectious, aren't they? Like if you want to influence people, then have good ideas and share them in a clear way, be sort of um, uh, engaging and, and, and you'll have some influence. So, so we'll go through that. Now on, on this topic of conflict resolution, I'm going to jump right to sort of the last um, thing here in a minute. I'll, I'll fill this in with something, but this is, I think a, a grid that most of you can understand. So that when, when you're dealing with a conflict, when you're dealing with another individual, there are these, this X and Y axis here, where uh, axis where where cooperation is along the horizontal axis, but being assertive in a sense, you know, which is not the opposite of cooperation, but it's a positive kind of uh, uh, noun that you can use that is like you know non cooperation. You know, and want to write that, but it's, being assertive is important, but also cooperating is important, and you can see the four elements here. I always like this. I think that there's a time for all four. Like if you're going to sort of memorize something to, to, to use as your crib sheet in conflict resolution, you're going to be living in one of these four boxes. Like there is a time to avoid conflict. <laughs> you know, it doesn't, you're not going to cooperate. You're not going to be assertive. You're going to step away. We can all think of a thousand times when that makes sense. You know, I've been married for 35 years. There's a reason for that. I've learned to avoid conflict. So there are times when that makes sense. There's also a time, just moving from left to right, to be accommodating, right? Where, you know, you want to be assertive, but, you know, there's times when it just doesn't make sense. You know, anybody who's involved in politics knows how that works. Now, go from jumping from avoiding, you know, north one box to competing, that's where you really are going head to head. And most people, when they think of conflict avoidance, immediately jump to that, right? You jump to, well, we're going to, uh, we're in our conflict resolution. We're going to, we're going to compete you against me. We're going to resolve this thing. And, um, you know, whoever stands up first um, is the winner. So that top left box is what most people think of. But I think you'd probably agree that the top right box is the best place to be, right? That's where you're being both accommodating and assertive. You're collaborating. It's, it's, that's when everything's sort of firing on all cylinders. So good thing to memorize, you know, as you're about to go into a negotiation, you know, maybe you're um, upset with your pay and you want to go talk to your boss. Maybe it's the uh, head of infrastructure, CIO, whoever, and you're going to go sit down and tell her that, um, Hey, um, you know, I'm, I'm not happy with my, uh, with my compensation and here's my case. You should be thinking, where am I going to be in this? Like if you decide not to do that, you've avoided the issue. If you go in and your boss says, forget it, hit the road and you say, okay. And you run out, you're being accommodating. If uh, your boss says, no, forget it. You fold your arms and say, I'm not leaving until you, you know, sign on the dotted line, you're being competing. But if you decide to engage in an intelligent conversation and you're being collaborating and what this all amounts to is compromise. So that's the idea. Compromising has elements of all four of these. So think that through. I think it's a powerful kind of thing. And, you know, look, we're all a bunch of gearheads. That's why I draw these diagrams because I think that's the way most of us think. Now, there's this book that was popular a long time ago, and I, I alluded to this last, uh, last week, and this was this book called Getting to Yes, very, very popular, you know, a couple of decades or so ago. But I like the title. I don't like the subtitle, frankly, Negotiating Agreement Without Giving In. Ugh, I, I don't agree with that at all. But I do agree with Getting to Yes. Like, that's another thing to memorize, because the whole idea is to get your whoever it is you're working with, I'd rather say partner than adversary, but whoever it is you're negotiating with and, and feeling conflict with, the goal is to get to some sort of yes. And we'll, we'll, I'll go through some examples here. and We'll use, again, some cybersecurity scenarios. But let me show you a couple just from sort of politics and life. These two guys are about as different as you could imagine from a, on the political spectrum, you know, Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill. Uh, Tip is a Boston politician, you know, hard-nosed Democrat, and Reagan on the opposite end of the spectrum, you know, Barry Goldwater-style Republican. Uh, both of these, in some sense, are sort of fossils now. I'm not sure either of those parties really exist. But here's what I love about this. 
you, everyone on this call, everyone listening right now has an adversary at work somewhere. We all do. There's somebody who manages to pull your chain. Um, don't know who it is, but I would advise that if it's somebody who sort of appear and kind of pulls your chain a little bit, take a lesson from Reagan and O'Neill and go make friends with that person. I don't care how you do it, but you should write it down as the goal from now until December 31st, 2020. If there's somebody who pulls your chain and really makes you a, just a constant conflict and always causing problems, then find that person. I guess nowadays with Corona, you can't go out to dinner, but find some way to break bread. And that's what these two guys did. Like there used to be a cartoon when I was a kid where these uh, two cartoon characters would you know, try to kill each other all day. And then they get their lunch pails and walk home at the end of the day and be best buddies. And then next day, go back to work and beat up on each other again. I think it's an amazing way to think about conflict between individuals and, 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 and even groups. So, so I want you to do that. I, I know that there's somebody. I hope it's not 10 people. By the way, if, if you find yourself, if you diagram all your conflicts, and it looks like you sit as the center node on this big uh, complex structure of conflict, then maybe you're the problem. <laughs> so, so you shouldn't have more than a couple of these. If you do, then you know, go look in the mirror and think, you know, am I being a little bit too barbed in everything that I do? But, but this is, I like this picture because you should try to find a way to, to get that person or individual, you know, get her or him, um, get a hold of them and say, hey, listen, you know, we, we, we tend to uh, have a lot of conflict at work. Let's talk a little bit. Where'd you grow up? Hey, what, what, how'd you come to this job? How many kids do you have? How many kids do you not have? You know, what do you like? What are your, what, what are your hobbies? What do you enjoy? And I guarantee you're going to find some things that you'll have in spectacular common. And then that's the thing that will provide that connection between you and that person. And you'll find that you're going to be way better at resolving conflict moving forward. Now, here's a famous picture. It came through a little blurry here, but this is the Camp David Accords you know, which amazingly is 42 years ago. It seems like this was just, you know, I was in high school then. But it was Jimmy Carter. The reason I like the picture here is not so much about the politics or anything, but this was the result of these folks getting together for 12 days in sort of secret negotiation. Think about that. You got a couple of adversaries and somebody arbitrating, you know, President Carter, and they sat for 12 days of negotiations in Camp David. I love that image because I think there are going to be times when you and your team or you and a customer or you and a sponsoring organization or you and whomever, probably not a malicious adversary, like two nation state adversaries, probably not going to sit down for 12 days of negotiation. I wish they would. But the, the idea that you'd plan a structured negotiation to come to some agreement, that probably that doesn't happen that much in business, does it? Like, think about your own career. Have you ever had a moment like this where you're in the middle or you're on either side? Have you ever had one where there was a problem, you set out to solve it, you took the time to fix it, and then at the end, everybody was smiling and Again, it's so funny, with coronavirus, it looks like they're sharing, you know, COVID-19 doing that, but you get the point. If you've never had a moment like this, what a shame, right? I mean, I, you know, I always have all these stray comments, but I'd ask that at some point you and your team think through, what was your best moment at work? What was the best day you ever had at work? And, and we'll come back to that at a, in a future session, but give that some thought. If, if you've never had a moment like this, then why don't you go create one? You know, where there's some conflict, get teams together, fix it, and then celebrate the resolution of that conflict. Doesn't happen often, but when it does, it could be very powerful. Now, I want to take you through, you know, our typical, we always have eight rules here and a bunch of examples and stories and so on. And then I, I want to leave some time here that we can talk to Chris. But let's go through some of the basic rules here. And, and these are ones that you can cherry pick which ones resonate with you. Some won't. Um, but the first one has to do with empathy. Here's, here's what I think 
you should recognize is a, is a major difference between individual contributors and managers. Managers meaning, meaning you're supervising the work of others. And, and, and there are people who rely on you for both management leadership and also performance review, saying a little raise and paycheck. They're trying to impress you. An individual contributor is, does not have a lot of eyeballs on her or him during their work. You want to see the output of the work. I want to see the output of your tests. I want to see the code you've written. I want to see the document you created. But the way you got to that is probably not as important, right? If you want somebody to write security policies for you and they like to do it in bed with a crayon, do you care? Probably not if it's good. Um, but managers, on the other hand, leaders, executives who, who are guiding a team along, people are watching you. And I've found in four decades that where, you know, kind of anger and resentment are maybe the worst emotions to feel, and more on that when we get to rule six, I, I've always felt empathy is the best one to have, not smarts. You know, we all, like all of us, if any three or four of us are in a bar somewhere talking, we're on enterprise security, you know we're talking about, you know, vendors and AI and machine learning and hacking and endpoint security. That's what we all like. And we're all evaluating each other as peers based on our technical competence. So you're going to hear from Chris in a little bit. You're going to say how smart Chris is. And you're going to say, wow, Chris is awesome. You're not going to know anything about how Chris manages or doesn't manage. But you're, man you're, you're observing the technical competence. As a manager, the technical competence is irrelevant. And, and I found that if you can demonstrate empathy, what empathy means is being able to climb into the other person's shoes. You know, like the spy recruitment example that I referenced here, I've had a few cases, tough cases, where um, spies have been identified in some context that I'd rather not get into right now. But I, when, I, when I would go sort of dig into afterwards what the scenario might be, where I was furious, like I, it was cases where you're just absolutely furious that some individual that maybe you had some connection to turns out to be, you know, working for say a country that you're not all that crazy about. I remember one case where I wanted to be furious, but I dug in a little bit. I asked the government to share a little bit of the detail. And they told me that this individual had basically gotten a call from the home country saying, we just moved your mom into a better place. And and this individual knew what that meant. It meant you better do what we say. And I remember just sort of stewing on that for a little bit and thinking about that. And while I don't condone the activity, it gave me at least a little bit of empathy because I kind of understood. I get it. If I'm off in some kooky country somewhere, you know, and um, and they call me, you know, let's say the United States calls and says, hey, listen, we, we got your mother here. Uh, well, what are you supposed to do? You, you know what I mean? So again, it doesn't condone it, but it, it helps you sort of develop the habit of empathy. And, and I think as a manager, it's something that I strongly urge that you, you build some sort of a, a facility with so that you do understand what it means to be empathetic. Let's go to the next one. This is um, conflict and wisdom. Uh, recognize that when you, when you do have conflict, that's progress, right? If you can work your way through conflict, that's progress. I don't think you can measure progress in units that include no friction. No friction, no growth. That's just the way it works. So think of conflict as an investment. That's a weird kind of thing, right? Like each time there's conflict, instead of being furious and throwing your briefcase down and saying, what is going on here? I don't need this. Well, why don't you think of it a different way and think of it as an opportunity? You know, when you pull a cue in Scrabble, <laughs> it's got a lot of power to you. You don't say, ah, oh, crap, am I going to use this thing? You're usually pretty happy because you know there's some, some punch to that letter and you're pretty happy. Well, conflict has punch too. So I'd ask that as you work your way through these things on a day-to-day -day basis, that you remember that that conflict brings some wisdom that allows you to make progress. Now, this is a good one because this, um, this is something that I think resonates with cybersecurity individuals. 
I'm using the phrase reset reboot, but here's what, here's what this means. This means that you can be certain that there will be misunderstandings once you are a, a manager. Like what, what, one thing that um, I, I've often recommended is that when you put a management team together, you should, you should kind of meld together personalities that, it, that are different, meaning you should program the conflict in. If you've ever read uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin, uh, uh, the book about the, the Reagan, or I'm sorry, the uh, Abraham Lincoln uh, cabinet, uh, Team of Rivals, I think it's called, um, going by memory, but I think that's what the book was called. I have an amazing story of putting together a, a group. But the reason I bring that up is that at some point, the leader leaves and, and a new group has to be put together. I think that's in some sense a reset or a reboot. Like it always reminds me that there are times when it's a good idea to just kind of reboot and start over. I can't tell you how many times there have been conflict situations for me that have festered where we both, or sometimes it's more than one or two in the, in the group, agreed, hey, it's time to just reset this thing. So think about your own situation right now. When you're driving home, we don't drive home anymore. We walk from our desk to the kitchen home now, but in a couple of months, we'll be driving home again. And you're really, really thinking about that thing, that problem, that individual, that group. Everybody listening can fill in the details on that. So think for a moment what it would mean to reboot that relationship. Like, what does it mean? Does it mean visiting with them and symbolically ripping up a piece of paper and saying, that's our old relationship, let's start over? Or does it mean you've got Mary in charge of the relationship and now you're going to, Mary's good at a bunch of things. Hey, let's move Mary out. I'm going to provide, you know, Alice is now going to come in and be your new liaison. We're just going to start over with a new couple of folks here that can just kind of reset and rebuild and reboot. Man, that's a really powerful concept. And I'm guessing some of you listening right now have that situation. And it would be my advice that if you do have that situation, consider this rule number three. I've found it to be very powerful. Rule four, this is related. And that's great relationships often start with conflict. They really do. That, that's why I really believe that as you're putting a team together, you should never, ever pick people to work for you who are just like you. It, so there's another question for you. Let's say you are a CISO, or let's say you manage a, you're an enterprise security manager, and you've got, um, I don't know, let's say you do vulnerability management, or pen testing, or you know, vendor selection, or something, and you've got a handful of people working for you. If those people working for you are a direct reflection of you, meaning you finish each other's sentences, you act the same, you look the same, you have the same kind of personality and approach, then I would consider that a weak team. And I don't even have to ask you what you do. It's weak. I know right off the bat it's weak. Because nothing builds more robustness in a team than diversity. And, you know, we talk a lot about diversity in a social context, and that's part of it. But I, what I'm talking about is diversity here in the way you actually deal with issues, in the way your, your instinct leads you to solve problems. So for me personally, I've always been a conflict avoider. And I've also been someone who would rather just give up and let somebody take the win the argument just so I can get back to something I think is important. And I knew I had that tendency. I've always had that tendency. So what kinds of people do I like to have reporting to me? People who are just the opposite, who are going to dig their heels in, who actually in some sense are comfortable with a little bit of conflict and would be the first one to pull me back and say, Ed, hold on a second. We're not walking away from this. this is, there's an injustice here. If you're not willing to stand up, I'll do it. <laughs> a lot of times, you know, me being the, 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 the weak negotiator that I often am, I do. I say, hey, dude, it's yours. And usually, more often than not, the result is better than if I had had somebody who had the same instinct. That's why when you have, that's the concept 
of a yes man and apologize for the referent of the, it's just that yes, women, I'm sure I have them too, but the, the colloquial phrase we've used for years is the yes man. And that's having a team around you that just says, oh, they're so great. You know, what a great answer that was boss. And gee, it's so great to work for you. And you're so, man, if you're in that situation, then you are a, a weak leader B, you've got a weak organization, and C, you shouldn't even be in a position of leadership. Because if you need that kind of stroking, maybe because mom didn't hold you enough when you are a kid or something, then you should not be leading an organization. So you need to be mature enough to recognize that great relationships start with conflict. I've retired from my full-time position as a CSI. Now, you know, I, I'm an analyst now, and I teach, but... but Back when I was sort of more active in a day-to-day role, there were people who had very different opinions than me. I got to tell you, they're the people that I sort of cherish reconnecting with. Enjoy it. I always felt like they were the most honest ones. They were willing to go right toe-to-toe with me and make me better, make all of us better. So recognize that if you have conflict with somebody at work, for God's sakes, don't book that on the on, on the liability side of the ledger. That's an asset. If you if you if you if you have a conflict with somebody about the way you treat problems, put book that on the asset side of your ledger. That's a good thing. It's something you should be proud of. You should display it, and you can display it. There's a lot of symbols. You all know that the little symbols that we throw out, say during meetings, the way we respond to comments, the way we you know, allow people to speak first, where people sit, you know, who we sort of nod to. Um, Those little symbols are important. And if somebody's let you have it during a meeting, and then afterwards, everyone sees you over joking with that person, that's a symbol that demonstrates what you value, that you value people not being afraid to step up with conflict. So don't be a wimp here. This is important. Conflict can produce great relationships. Now, the contrapositive here is sometimes refusing to engage is really effective. You know, and I I don't mean refusing to engage in some sort of a passive aggressive sort of way. I mean, sometimes it's just not the right um, situation, the right context. Um, the right the right time to to engage. Sometimes walking away is really important, and the high road is important too. Like if something's getting a little bit ridiculous, there's a discussion. You're at a meeting and things are going awry. I, I I've been in some meetings recently where the discussion has been around CCPA and the GDPR and, and and how intently organizations should be really um, paying attention to privacy. And there've been times when I heard the conversation just going way in the wrong direction, you know, around how to quote unquote, get around those kinds of things. And, and I wanted to say, come on, people buying a bunch of jerks, those regulations, whether you hate or love regulations, privacy rules and rights, like the rights that CCPA offer, they're there for a reason. And it's not these arbitrary things that are there to torture security teams, you know, with the locating data and it's your job to get it, quote unquote, get around it. So I've been in those meetings and I remember just wanting to say something and then saying, Ed, now's not the time. It's not the time. And I, I blogged recently about what a bad board member I am. Like I, I've sat on some boards, some pretty high profile boards and I was always that guy and still kind of am. This is one of my weaknesses is that I don't follow rule five. And a lot of times I can't stand it. Something is said that's stupid and I'm waiting. And then I heave a sigh and I say, all right. And then I have to engage. And sometimes it embarrasses someone. Sometimes it infuriates uh, whoever's leading the discussion. And in my case, it's an, I've infuriated many a major CEO that just wanted to kill me. And, and I remember coming out of a couple of very high profile meetings where I did this and I called my wife and, and I was sort of chuckling, but she wasn't. She's like, you know, she probably said something like, hey, Ed, refusing to engage is often effective. She probably said something like that. You know, learn just there's a time and a place for conflict. So if you're like me and listen, 
cybersecurity people, we are so prone to that. You know, we're, we are. We're prone to logic. And, you know, if you hear somebody say something stupid, I, I, there's times I just can't stand it. I have to say something. And it's a real weakness for me. So work on that. If you're also that person, then, <laughs> then you probably have had some amusing times you know, where you win the argument, you probably, you know, you end up losing the war. So don't, don't allow that to be a habit. That's a really, really dangerous habit. Make sure you're willing to, to walk away. Now, the, rule six, I think, may be the most important one here, and I want to spend a little time on this. Um, anger. So I, in a career that spanned, you know, four decades for me, I, I can almost categorize everyone that I've ever worked for into two camps, the ones who are, get angry all the time and the ones who don't. <laughs> so you can't change who you are, you know, and I do, I have tend to have a, a an anger streak. I, I, I hide it. My mother and father joke that, you know, my uh, Amoroso is a Sicilian name. And we joke that maybe there's a, a little strain of anger that comes through from my great great grandfather to my grandfather, my my there's an anger streak there that I, I don't know that there's much I can do about it. Um, I can't make it go away, but what I can do is I can learn to manage it. Now, if you are a person who has a very calm nature, then that's good. I mean, sometimes a little anger is good, give you a little kick in the butt. But um, if you're if anger is not a problem for you, then rule six is not all that important. But if you're like me. I'm going to guess, you know, we've got almost you know, almost 300 people here listening. I'm going to guess half of you um, have problems with anger where something just infuriates you. Here's what I want you to do. And this is what, this is one thing my, my dad recommended it. And I'll give you a couple of examples. But what he recommended was don't make decisions when you're angry, period. Just don't make, don't, don't engage decisions when you're angry. So here's the way I've translated that. I, I've been teaching over at Stevens for 32 years. Now I'm at NYU now for the last four. And when I pass out exams, the, the, I mean the um, graded exams, and give it out to the class, I always say the following. I say, I read in um, Dale Carnegie, the, uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People, that apparently the German army, you know, through all the wars that they fought, had this rule that said, if you have a complaint, you can make a complaint. Anybody can make a complaint if you're angry, but you have to wait 24 hours before your complaint is engaged. So that means you can say, I have a complaint. Fine, clock starts now. You can't tell me the complaint, but 24 hours from now you can. So when I hand out exams, I always say, I will listen to anything you have. If you're angry at your grade, if you think I was unfair, I'll listen to anything, but not now. We're going to talk next week. I say, no. so people come up and they go, hey, I say, listen, next week we talk. Not now, next week. You come next week, we talk. 100% I'll sit here for three hours. If every one of you are angry, we'll talk all. And what I've found is since doing that, something like 90% of the complaints go away because that moment of anger somehow travels to something softer and eventually gets to a position that's much more rooted in fact. And there are times when the anger is justified. Somebody didn't add the numbers right and it's, it's wrong. Hey, professor, you gave me an 82 here, but I got 40 on this section and 52 on that section. I think it's a 92. Where'd this 82 come from? Obviously I, I added wrong. Obviously, you're going to get justice. You're furious right now. You're not going to let that go next week. You're going to come up and go, look. And I said, okay, yeah, you're right. I, I mess, I'm really sorry. Boom, you get justice. But if you just think, hey, what do you, you think? Look at this great answer that I gave. You know, I wrote 10 pages of this stuff. It was really great what's going on. And then I say, I'll talk to you next week. And you go home and you think about it. And you think, well, it really was. He did say answer briefly, and I did write 10 pages. And the truth is I really didn't know the answer. And well, let's let that go. The anger goes down, facts enter, and you think more clearly. 
So look, cybersecurity folks, I, I think are maybe even a little prone to this one a little bit. Um, because again, for a lot of us, there's a frustration that comes when something logical is not being followed. That, that's what always gets me angry. Like for me, the rub is always, I see something clearly. And what are you, an idiot? Don't you see this? And, and when they don't, I want to get furious, but I've learned not to. I've learned, and, and, and there's this, these famous things. I remember Harry Truman had the buck stops here on his desk. And I think um, Thomas Watson had the word think on his desk. You know, there's all these different um, things that people put. For me, it's don't make decisions when you're angry. Um, I don't have anything on my desk that says that, but I, if I did, I, it's what it would say. So, so that's an important one. I hope you internalize that. And for those of you who have a problem with that, that's a big one. Let's do number seven. Now, this is a math problem. Let's start with the 24 hours you have every day. So your brain in, is, is a, can theoretically engaged for 24 hours a day, but you're probably going to sleep about eight of those. And those of you who sleep less than eight hours, don't brag about that. If, you, if you're somebody who goes, hey, I get by in three, four hours a day, then you're working suboptimally. I don't care who you are, um, whether you're you know, president or a or a, uh, a, a golfer or a uh, baseball player or a CEO or whatever. If you're saying you get by in three hours a day, then that's not something to brag about. But let's say you got 24 minus eight, that leaves you 16 hours. Um, you're probably going to eat a little bit, so maybe two hours, that's 14 hours. Then you may have some things you'd like to do that are leisure, two, three hours, that's about 11 left. Maybe you work eight to nine hours, so nine. So you basically have two hours per day that you can think about stuff, okay? If, you, if your thinking equals stewing on conflict, then you are wasting some of the most important hours of your life. So let's, let's go over that again. You got to eat, work, go to meetings, commute, all this crap you're doing. And yeah, commute can be thought time too. It is for me. But there's only going to be a couple hours a day where you're not busy and you can think of stuff. I, I've learned, and I've, again, something I learned from my dad, that you should, make, you should do two things. Schedule time with yourself to use the think, that, 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 that real estate in your brain for a couple of hours to solve a problem, to fix something, to come up with something new. Like I, I, a lot of times I'll park in Midtown uh, Manhattan and walk down to my office on Fulton Street. That's a long walk, it's an hour and a half. But I'll do that because I may have something that I want to figure out. I, I, like there's something I don't know. I've been asked to do um, a, a, a report on blah, 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 5G security for this or that. And I, go, I don't really know what that is. And I'll say, all right, tomorrow I'm going to drive in, park, and for an hour and a half, I'm going to solve that problem. I have a little pad with me as I walk, and my backpack on, maybe get a coffee, and then walk. Hour and a half walk. And by the time I'm getting down through Tribeca, I've got it. And I've sketched something out, and I used my brain time to do something cool. Not stewing and being angry and playing through the fight and figuring out what you'll say when you fight and how dare they do this. And uh, come on, man, if that's what you're doing, you're wasting so much time. I've had a lot of managers work for me over the years who sit down with me for like quarterly reviews. And I want to talk about positive things. All I want to talk about is some injustice. Oh, this be you. I can never get them to to, to listen to our awareness program. What's going on here? Why won't they do it? It's bothering me. It's, it's that such and such over there who just doesn't like our program. And, you know, they, they're, they're trying to go after us. They don't want blah, blah. And you're thinking, is this what you think about all day? Really? Are you stewing on that conflict? You know, hey, why don't we turn the temperature down here? Why don't you think of something positive? Go break bread like all these early things. Hey, have some empathy, maybe a reason for that recognize that your wisdom comes from that conflict. So take advantage of it. Maybe go reboot with that organization. Why don't you go over there and rip up a piece of paper symbolically? You know, what, maybe it makes sense to, to, to go over and uh, learn what they're about. Figure, blah, 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 all the stuff we talked about. 
But if you're the kind of person who stews on conflict and just keeps chewing it in your brain and regurgitating it and then re-swallowing it, I'm using these disgusting terms because that's what stewing on conflict is. If you do that, you're going to ruin your career with that. I guarantee you. Nobody gets ahead because of anger and resentment. And yes, I know that there's some spectacular examples of something that appears to be getting ahead, but that's not my definition of getting ahead. Getting ahead means having a mission, something you believe in that makes the world better, and then being able to act on that. If what you're doing is not making things better, you're wasting your time. And that's why cybersecurity is kind of cool, right? Because we get to engage these habits we have to mess around with computers and networks. What do you hear from Chris? There's somebody who loves tech. So she gets to do that, but she also knows that we're not just selling coconuts here, right? We're, we're doing some, something to help um, infrastructure and make communication better, make the world better. Look at coronavirus and we can all still keep working. Why is that? Because we do computing and we know how to connect people. If this hit, coronavirus had hit 30 years ago, we wouldn't even be having this conversation. There's, there's no Zoom or anything like that then. Cybrary was just a, a little gleam in somebody's um, uh, future mind. So, so we should be proud of that. But the point is, just stop the festering. If that's a habit you have, cut it out. Let's do our last one before we get to our discussion with Chris. And this is the triangulation argument. Um, if you don't know what triangulation means, that means you know, sort of bouncing things around without being direct. Like if you're that person who gets a message to someone, you know, to, to resolve a conflict by talking to someone, then I remember when my daughters were in seventh and eighth grade, messages were always sent through triangulation, you know, originally notes, now it's texts and, and social media. So if you're a seventh grade, you know, boys do it too, boy or girl, then you know what triangulation is. But if you're a grown-up managing a team and dealing with important cybersecurity issues, then give me a break. You know, go back and look and see. And if you're doing this, if there's a lot of go-betweens when you're trying to deal with some kind of conflict, let's say an auditor is giving you a heck about something and you're sending a message to one manager to tell the audit engagement manager to tell the auditor this thing and then get the result and they pass it, play his telephone tag. Why don't you just go to the next meeting? There's nothing wrong with that. Go there early, meet everyone, thank them for doing this great audit, say we've got an issue here. And here's what I was thinking, rather than pass it down through three levels and triangulating over, I thought I'd just come by and, and here's what's on my mind. What, what were you thinking for this? Let's think about the message that sends and how that is, is such a breath of fresh air for people who, like me, um, are not very good at that triangulation. When somebody tells me something, I always manage to get it mixed up and messed up. And I hate when someone, a manager, asks me to do it because I, I know that I'm not a very reliable relay of, of, of information. So. So this rule eight, I think, is something I like, I like finishing on this one with um, this idea that be direct. If you're going to, if you're going to engage and go directly, just do it directly with the source. And I think you'll find out that it will give you some useful uh, results. So these are the rules and, and topics that kind of help us through. I'm going to go back here to the first page here as we engage Chris. Um, that's a, there's 12 angry men. That's the picture there. There's um uh, Henry Fonda here. It was a good movie if you haven't seen it. And it's about, here's uh, Jack Klugman, who what, was in The Odd Couple. That's so funny seeing him so serious there. But um, yeah, so take a, take a look at this movie. The movie is very good. Now, let's see. Chris, can you hear me okay? I can hear you. Oh, that's good. Thanks for uh, hanging in there for 45 minutes as I've you know gone, gone off. But now it's about you. Much more interested in hearing... Um, about you. First, I want you, if you'd be okay, just tell the uh, folks a little bit about your, your, your background and a little bit about your work at, uh, at Hypersec. And then I know you've got a couple of cool stories that you're going to share, but first tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, uh, I deal a lot with conflict and my <laughs> main areas are actually uh, dealing with uh, 
many different countries, uh, trading blocks, uh, militaries, uh, you name it, uh, dealing with cyber warfare, mm. which is basically uh, a way that uh, technology can now um, kind of kill people um, in a conflict uh, manner. And um, it, it's not... I would say the easiest thing to deal with when you're dealing with different countries, law enforcement and so forth, but you have to try to find a resolution and solve that puzzle to mm. move forward. And sometimes as quickly as possible, but uh, I like some of your points, uh, you know, go to the direct source, for example, uh, because in certain situations you cannot afford your message or any other messages to be garbled. So, yes. Have you seen that triangulation, right? When people are afraid to go and they tell this person to tell that person. And you feel like, well, I feel like I'm back in sixth grade here, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's usually because people are afraid to take uh, conflict head on, right? I mean, that's the reason you do it. You just don't want to deal with it. So you can, in some sense, you just create, um, make things worse. So. Oh, absolutely. Now tell us, you always have some interesting stuff. Um, I know you're both a prolific technologist and also author, but um, tell, there, I know there's a couple of things you wanted to share. Let's hear a couple of your juicier stories. Well, uh, I'm going to describe two uh, short but kind of juicy stories. Uh, one of them is in 2014, the Royal uh embassy of Saudi Arabia was uh, hacked by an insider uh, with diplomatic immunity and tied in with a terrorist group and a nation state. So it was lots of fun. Not really, but really, but not really. <laughs> and uh, there were certain reasons why I was chosen to be the uh, liaison for the government of Saudi Arabia to deal with the matter as well as do the technical investigations. And uh, one of those reasons was I had built trust uh, within the country and within my company, uh, part of the Saudi Aramco family. And they knew that they could trust me. They also... Uh, knew that I was able to talk to the uh, precise level that I needed to talk to. So one of the ways that you can get people to understand what you need them to understand is try to look at it both from their perspective, remember their culture, especially in a multinational organization, and also use terminology that they are used to. Um, describing a, a packet capture to an executive is not going to work, but they actually do understand the term exploitation because that's also a business term. So keep those things in mind, but also one thing to remember is um, build that trust before an incident happens because incidents happen, plain and simple. And with that, when you build trust, uh, you also can foster what I call leadership champions. So people who can quote unquote vouch for you and also uh, people that you can go to for advice if uh, you are in an area that you're not used to and people like it when uh, you ask them advice. Mm. And that really does foster a good deal of trust and breaks through quite a bit of barriers. So when the embassy was unfortunately hacked uh, because of a password of, remember this folks, don't use this password, one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, this was obviously not a great thing to happen. Well, they left the zero out. So that obviously yes. is a little bit, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Now, you know, at the same time, when you go into something like this, <laughs> you, you also have to remember that uh, you can't just be in a, a kind of aggressive manner going, what do you mean your password was this? I mean, this is an embassy. Come on. Uh, you have to be as diplomatic as possible and explain the risks in situations in a way that is not adversarial. And you have to be very, very careful with that because yes, uh, some things went wrong, but at the same time, these types of things happen a lot. Mm. Uh, anyone can do something like that. 
Uh, anyone can leave a, a default password up and forget to change it. Uh, someone, you know, on the technical side can reactivate what's called the any any rule on a firewall by mistake. Whether it's you, your team, a third party who does something like that, uh, mistakes and things happen. So try your very best not to chastise because uh, it's just going to cause more issues in a conflict situation. And that's what incidents are. Um, now you also have to remember that many of us work for multinationals and depending on what your company and organization does, uh, you have to study a little bit about the geopolitics involved, the cultures involved, and remember that when you are trying to, um, speak to other people. And also I liked what you were saying of, you know, try to learn their perspective try to kind of step in their shoes and remember that everyone's a human being at the end of the day, when they go home, they may or may not have families, they have their own lives. Now at the same time, since we're dealing with cybersecurity and we're dealing with, uh, for instance, if you work for the government or you work for a, a big multinational uh, that has a lot of stake in the market, um, because of uh, certain cybersecurity incidents, this could actually lead to loss of life or limb. So you have to keep that in mind if that happens to be the situation. Uh, the situation with the embassy, we had uh, threats against a uh, national landmark in the Netherlands in The Hague which is supposed to be the city of peace. And the terrorist group was threatening to kill over 400 people if we didn't pay up. Right. And so you have to, for instance, um, negotiate and resolve certain things. Now imagine if this is a cybercrime syndicate who has locked down all of your intellectual property and your organization is about to go to market or to get investors and they've got you, you know, by the throat you have to figure out a way to uh, try to find a resolution to that conflict. So uh, you have to be very aware of that because obviously everyone in an incident is going to have their own agenda and uh, you definitely need to learn what that agenda is and figure out how to solve that puzzle mm -hmm. and get through it, not in an aggressive way, but in a way that is very conducive to communication you know, Chris, it's funny, you, you raise a really interesting scenario here, and that's that a lot of the examples I gave were kind of organizational ones, but if you're the, the hired consultant, that adds a whole new dimension, doesn't it? Because now it's your customer, and it takes a lot of guts to show conflict with a customer. You know, maybe they're, they're paying a, a, a lot of money, they might have some really strange approach to something, what do you do if you're in a consulting engagement and you really feel like something's not right and, and you feel like there's conflict? Is, is there a, a special way you do it as a consultant versus like if I was working for you, I'd sit down, we're both in the same organization. I'd say, hey, Chris, let's not have an issue. We'd talk it through. We work together. But if, if you had hired me and you're paying me to do something, it feels like that's a weirder scenario. How, how do consultants deal with this problem? Well, one of the ways is think about how the outcome of the situation will affect your um, hireability back as mm. a consultant. And yeah. also remember that many companies will hire a consultant to deal with conflict because suddenly this is more of an independent party. And so you don't get wrapped up in some of the politics and bureaucracy that might be in that organization. So to me, uh, it actually gives me a lot of leverage because of that. And uh, another point is because consultants are typically paid uh, a bit better than a person or an employee inside an organization. <laughs> not, uh, always, that, not always, but <laughs> not always, but I liken it to the difference between um, a $12 bottle of wine and a hundred dollar bottle of wine where the taste difference might not be that much, but uh, people are going to go, Ooh, ah, look at that hundred dollar bottle of wine. And they're going to want it more. So there's actually some very good advantages uh, to being that outside party. 
That's interesting. What What are some other uh, stories? And, and you you always have some interesting. Stuff. I'm <laughs> well, not going to ask. I won't ask you how you got involved with Saudi Arabia, but uh, maybe some well, other. actually, they they called me out of the blue <laughs> after they were hit by the world's most devastating cyber warfare attack when the Iranians launched a, a wiper malware against them and wiped out 85 percent of the Windows based uh, systems. Oh, almost. Was that Shim- Shimon thing. Yep. Yeah. 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 That was unbelievable. Yeah. Now, um, I've been getting more and more into uh, trying to solve a lot of questions about cyber warfare because uh, there is currently no uh, internationally defined uh, meaning behind that word. You know, some countries think it's one thing, some countries think it's another. I happen to see in the chat about, uh, you know, if I could answer certain questions about China and the USA with some of our stalemate when it comes to uh, some of these cyber attacks. Now, um, in one particular occasion, I was helping to uh, plan and run the uh, European Union and NATO cyber warfare exercises in Brussels. Mm, wow. And, and what that involved was we get all of these member countries and NATO and also uh, countries that don't belong uh, to these organizations yet, uh, but they have observer status. And we gave them uh, some very realistic uh, scenarios, uh, one of which was, we called it uh, Dead Canary, uh, and for a reason, was uh, finally a uh, cyber warfare attack uh, hit critical infrastructure and took out things like the signaling on the London Underground train during rush hour and the trains collided, killing many, many people, hurting many, many people. And we were trying to get these countries and groups to uh, come to a consensus on what the actions would be. And what we noticed, and I think this is also very good for conflict, is if we put everyone together, they could not come to a consensus. But if we broke them up into groups, Uh, then those smaller groups could actually come to a consensus. And then overall, the groups could then come to a much better consensus. Uh, There was only, you know, one one outlier uh, where they actually uh, decided that they were going to consider launching a nuclear weapon in the upper atmosphere of the attacking country. But that was a bit of an outlier. Mm -hmm. Um, But learning from that, It's one of the things that I'll be talking about. I was asked to speak in a closed session to the permanent members states of uh, the United Nations and certain UN missions on the 2nd of July to represent the private sector on this particular topic of what to do if there's a cyber malicious attack against critical infrastructure Mm -hmm. and what the joint response should be. And uh, it's going to be a very interesting dialogue. What are you going to tell them? What are you going to tell them? (laughs) Well, I'm going to use a a good deal of the research and experience I've I've accumulated. And I've been working on a side project with the uh, European Union Union and the United States on the joint response that both of our uh, trading blocks should actually take if either or. Uh, become subject to uh, something that involves loss of life or limb uh, for cyber warfare Mm -hmm. because it can affect both economies so much. So uh, I'll be trying to uh, dispel some of the myths, but at the same time, uh, try to get people to talk and try to get a common understanding as best possible. Well, I hope they run that on C-SPAN. That'd be something I would certainly watch. I was, that's my, my favorite thing to watch. Hey, there's a question here that I'm going to send mm-hmm. your way. It's from uh, Andrea asking about when you're part of a team, do you think, um, so Chris, in your experience, if you're in a team, do you think it's the role and responsibility of the leader to solve conflict that should work? Or should it be one of these things where, you know, mom and dad say to the kids, hey, go go work it out amongst yourselves. Well, what's been your experience with that? Well, I think it's been mixed depending on the situation where sometimes you have to talk to the team members and uh, get them to try to understand the other person's perspective, Hmm. let them think about it. Don't let them, you know, fester, uh, come back the next day after a bit of sleep and really think about things. And in most cases, that works really well. Basically, uh, direction 
trying to direct uh, the conversation. Sometimes, of course, uh, you do have to be the leader that and uh, decide ultimately what's going on. And uh, unfortunately, there's not always super happy endings where everybody is happy. Um, but at the same time, if you act like the leader that you want to be, then uh, many people will understand that they might actually not be aware of the bigger picture and why certain decisions were made. Well, I think that's good advice. And, you know, we're, we're at the top of the hour here, but I want to make sure I give a little plug here. Uh, for those of you who haven't read any books by uh, Chris Quebec, I hope you go on. I, uh, Chris, I'm assuming Amazon's the way everybody buys books yes. now, right? I think if they just type your name in, I love your OSINT book. I think that's a really good one. But I hope you guys will take some time to go off and uh, buy a copy of one of Chris's books. And maybe if you see uh, Chris on uh, C-SPAN 2 at 3 in the morning, you'll, you'll be glad that you... Uh, read one of her very fine books. Chris, I want to thank you for sharing your, your stories and your advice and a little bit about yourself with the group here. Uh, it's very, very much appreciated. Well, thank you very much, Ed. Great. And on behalf of the whole group here and um, uh, with the Cyber team, I want to thank everybody for joining. And this is session two of six. So hopefully you've enjoyed it and hopefully we'll see you on our next session. Um, I think it's a week from now. So everyone stay healthy and stay safe. And we'll talk to you in about a week. So long, folks.